Well, good morning. It's good to see you this morning, the last Sunday of the year. We're going to ask you to stand. We're going to worship this morning. We're still singing about that love that God gave us when he sent Jesus, that amazing love. Hallelujah. Your love is amazing. <coughs> Amazing, steady and unchanging. Your love is a mountain firm beneath my feet. Your love is a mystery. How you gently lift me when I am surrounded. Your love carries me. surprising I can feel it rising all the joy that's growing deep inside of me every time I see you all your goodness shines through I can feel this God song rising up in me Praise the Lord. Hallelujah simply means praise the Lord. And that's a great way to start our service. You may be seated. Brazilians are so loud. <laughs> they're loving, they're kind. And they are always laughing. They're touchy-feely people. They're very busy. If they're not at work or at school, they're stuck in traffic. That's Brazilians for me. They're just so incredible, but human in the end. They just have such a hard time trusting anything that comes after something you say about Jesus. They already have this idea, this false idea of who he is, and there's nothing about Jesus that is life-giving to them. Então, você não deve fazer isso e aquilo, e se você faz isso, Deus, Deus não vai te amar. E isso me afastou muito de frequentar as igrejas e, e de Deus. That's hard. It's hard to continue day after day when, um, sorry, Lord, why, why am I here when these people that, like, you've let me love, like, you are not what they want. And there have been plenty of days until today that I just want to give up. 
but I just keep reminding myself that the power of salvation is not in my hands and it's all in Jesus and He is so capable and so able of changing their hearts because He has changed mine. E aí teve um dia que eu tava me sentindo um pouco triste e eu lembrei da Amanda. E eu decidi mandar uma mensagem para ela. She ended up sending me a text one day and said, I'm upset. I'm not necessarily enjoying the way that my life's going and I want to change. And in that moment, I just put it all out there and said, I'm doing about 500 things with my church today. If you'd like to come along, you're welcome to any of it. And she was like, absolutely. I was so surprised, but she said, absolutely, let's go. With Amanda, the Brazilian Amanda, she actually asked me to study the word with her. And just last week when we were reading, she was like brought to tears that God would love her even though she, she has come to the realization that she is a sinner, that she is separated from God. But the truth that he loves her when all she has known is that She's a sinner, God judges her. She was like, there's no other God who says this. Ainda não sinto total confiança nisso, mas eu estou buscando e What love that he has demonstrated to her. Like this city is huge, this world is huge, and he cares about the separation of one of his creation. That's crazy. <laughs> I don't know. I'd find that video early, but that's crazy. I'm sorry. last night. Yeah. <laughs> Our friend Amanda chose to put her faith in Jesus. I know that it's so real. I know that the Holy Spirit is moving in her and it's just amazing to see Amanda in the purest form and just understanding what she has won in Christ and the victory that he has won for her. But now comes like the most exciting part. Of her knowing relationship with God, and God is going to use her to bring others to know Him and to. I mean, she has a redemption story. She has a from death to life story. This is a reality that God is saving people, and He is pursuing young adults in São Paulo, and He is not giving up. talk about those who have never heard of the name of Jesus. There are also many, such as what you've seen today, who have heard of Jesus, but they don't really know the truth of Jesus. One of the things they said in the video was that to these individuals in Brazil, there is nothing life-changing, excuse me, yeah, there's nothing about Jesus that's life-giving. Can you imagine if you thought that, that the Lord was distant, that he was just aloof, that he was just waiting for you to mess up so that he could punish you? And yes, we have those individuals in our world, uh, in, in our country, our community, that still have that view of the Lord. But imagine a whole nation, a whole people, a group of people that don't know that there is anything life-giving in Jesus. And so we have, fortunately, missionaries in these places uh, trying to correct that, investing in individuals like you've seen here. But as you catch what one of the missionaries said, it's hard to continue day after day. Can you imagine having to face that uh, difficulty and not seeing the progress that you would like and it's frust the frustrations that come with that? But what I think what helps our missionaries is just to know that they have people that are supporting them day after day. And that's why we continue to emphasize our Lottie Moon Christmas offering and, and encourage you to pray for international missions uh, because the, the struggles are real. They're difficult on the field. 
and uh, they know that there are people back home praying for them and are giving so they can stay on the field and not have to worry about raising their own funds. Uh, and you and I play a role in that. So just encourage you, as always, continue to give sacrificially. Uh, we'll take up the offering about three more Sundays. Uh, the, our last Sunday will be, we'll wrap up with our annual meeting. We'll do our soup and, our, excuse me, our chili cook-off. And uh, during that time, uh, you'll be able to vote for the best chili by giving toward uh, that individual's chili. And then we'll tally everything up and whoever has the most money wins thing. Uh, but everything that's given that day goes to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. And 100% of everything given to this offering goes straight to the mission fields. Just want to encourage you uh, to continue to pray, continue to give, and let's continue to look for opportunities where we can go. I'm glad that you've chosen to be with us today and uh, know that it's probably everybody... Uh, some of us have had all the food we want, and that takes a lot for some of us. Uh, you're probably ready for a routine once again, uh, a lot of going and coming and that sort of stuff. But to know that today we have this time where we can just kind of not sit and relax and, and not participate, but in a, in a sense, we get to just put out all the distractions, hopefully, and focus on the Lord and use this time to honor Him and allow Him to work in our lives. So let's pray together, and let's prepare our hearts along those lines today. God, thank you for the privilege of being here in this place and the comforts that we enjoy with many who support us and who love us that we, we know dearly, we know deeply, and we desire to be here. So we pray that as we come that you would help us to focus on you. Lord, we thank you for your hand upon us this past week and as we focused on the birth of your son and celebrated that. His family came and went and his individuals were on the road and just to know how your hand was upon us and brought us here. That in the joys you were with us and in the heartaches we found ourselves in this week, you were also there. And just pray that as we come that we can just still ourselves in your presence, to be still before you and know that you are God. That you are on your throne, that you're orchestrating everything that's happening in the world, that nothing surprises you. And as you're doing all of those things, yet you are attuned to our hearts today. By your Spirit, you meet us here, you gather with us, and you desire to work in our lives. So let us present a heart in which you can work. Let us be moldable today. Lord, use this time to prepare us for what you want us to do in the advancement of your kingdom. We do think of those serving on our behalf around the world, such as these we've watched today. We're thankful for the life change that's happened in Amanda's life. We just pray that you would continue to encourage those today that are having a hard time continuing the work day after day due to the frustrations that they face. Would you encourage them today and remind them of the support they have among Southern Baptists? Lord, forgive us of our sins, I pray. Let nothing hinder what you want to do in our lives today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the midst of the, the Civil War, a poem was written on Christmas Day bemoaning the fact that there, despite all the wonderful things of Christmas and what Jesus came to do, there still wasn't peace on earth. And you'll remember that hymn, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. It starts out kind of depressing, but it has a great message at the end. Let's stand together as we sing, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. I 
Well, this morning, if you would take your copy of God's Word and join us in Luke chapter, we're going to back up in the story to go to the story of Zechariah, often overlooked in the Christmas story, only told to us by Luke as he gives us a different perspective of the birth of Jesus. Luke chapter 1, we encounter this couple, Zechariah and Elizabeth. Later we know that their son became, becomes, or is John the Baptist, uh, who comes to prepare the way for Jesus. And I want us to see is here Today, one thing about Zechariah that stands out to me, where he began to question the answer. You'll pick up on that, Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah, who belonged to the priestly division of, of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless, because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty, and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were outside praying. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you. And many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Verse 18, Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondered why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. A defendant was on trial for murder. There was strong evidence indicating his guilt, but one problem the state had was there was no corpse, no body had ever been found. And in the closing statements of the or statement by the defense, the lawyer, knowing that his client would probably be convicted because of the amount of other evidence, resorted to a trick. He addressed the jury, ladies and gentlemen, I have a surprise for you. He looked down at his watch. He said, within one minute, the person presumed dead in this case will walk into the courtroom. And then he turned and looked toward the door. And for one minute there was silence. He looked, but every juror, also stunned, looked on eagerly. And a minute passed, nothing happened. And the lawyer broke the silence by telling them, actually, I made up the previous statement. But all of you looked on with anticipation. Therefore, I tell you that you have a reasonable doubt in this case as to whether or not anyone was actually killed, and you cannot return a verdict of guilty. Well, the jury was obviously confused, and they retired to deliberate. And within just a few minutes, they told the judge they had a verdict. He brought the jury back in, and they pronounced the verdict of guilty. The lawyer immediately stood up and said, Your Honor, but how? How? There had to be some doubt. I saw every one of the jurors look at the door. And the foreman, although he wasn't, spoke up and said, Oh, we looked, but your client didn't. The jury, 
had enough doubt, or at least enough curiosity to look. But there was no doubt in the defendant. But the doubt did not keep the jury from doing their job. If we look at our life, there's probably always some element of doubt. I mean, we're, we're normal. We have questions. Doubt arises. In our spiritual life, we'll find ourselves walking with the Lord. We can be strong in His might. We can be doing great things for Him and yet still struggle with doubt. It's not a sin to doubt. Understand me. But it is a sin to settle on unbelief, which angers God. When our doubt leads to unbelief, we upset God. That's what happens here with Zechariah. Zechariah and Elizabeth have prayed for a child. Verse 13, the angel points that out, that God has heard your prayer for a child. To not have children in this culture was a sign of divine punishment. And so for years, Elizabeth and Zechariah suffered personal and social disgrace. And now the angel comes and tells them, God has heard your prayer, and you're going to have a son. You imagine the excitement that should have been there in Zechariah's life. Many of you, you know that. You've struggled with having children, and God blesses you with a child or multiple children, and you know the joy that comes. Or even if you, you didn't struggle, you know the joy that comes when you know you're going to have a baby. Zechariah, though, begins to question the answer. How can I be sure? How often... It hit me. Do we pray for God to do something? And when God answers our prayers, we question the answer. How often do we ask God to to break through an area in our life and God begins to break through and show us what's required of us and we begin to question the answer? This hit me about the first part of the month, several weeks ago. On a Friday it was a rainy Friday. You know, we've had a lot of those rainy days this month. And uh, I, I wasn't preaching that Sunday. It was one of, like, maybe the, the musical was, was the next Sunday. And so I sat down and thought, I'm going to work ahead on some sermon stuff. And was just reading through the Christmas story, and this jumped out. It was the day after our staff retreat. We had spent time talking. I had talked with some other folks about ministry opportunities our church had and things. And, and, through some of those opportunities, I had begun to go, well, you know, I'm not sure about that. And before I could ever preach to you, you know, it has to be preached to myself first. And God asked the question, Clint, you've prayed for some of these things. I've given you the answer, and yet you don't want to walk forward. You've asked for doors to be open and walls to come down and these things have happened, and now you begin to question the answer. And that has stayed with me the last few weeks. As I've looked at that, I think about how often I see that, not just in my life, but in our church as well. That we pray for God to use us, we pray for God to give us opportunities, we want God to do work, and then he opens up doors, he gives us opportunities, but he finds us questioning the answer. And here we are at the brink of a new year, at the time when we think about new plans, new opportunities, adjustments we need to make in our life. We think about them, we may not do them, but at least we know there's some things that we need to change and probably have been needing to change for a long time, but January the 1st gives us the opportunity to, to make some changes, make some adjustments in our life. And how often is when we would look back over the last year, would we say that we missed opportunity after opportunity because we questioned the answer? And we're marked by unbelief. And we have the opportunity not to wait to January the 1st, but today to correct this in our life, to remove unbelief, to begin to remove some doubt in our life because that doubt leads to unbelief when we do not deal with that. So today, I want us to look at some observations regarding this unbelief, to learn from Zechariah some truths that you and I need to know regarding unbelief. And the first one is that it can happen to anyone. I've learned in ministry never to say that it won't happen to me or it won't happen to others. 
Because things can happen to anyone. As I see guys that I consider heroes of the faith, some of the strongest men of faith that I know have moral failures and they lose their family and lose their ministries, I begin to understand that it can happen to anyone but by the grace of God. Zechariah, if we were to describe his family, we would describe them as being impeccable spiritually. Their priestly service, we would say, was second to none. The way that he lived his life, also Elizabeth belonged to an honored priestly family. We would look at these two people as their community did, and we would elevate them and say, that's who we want to be like. I want to be like Zechariah someday. I want to be like Elizabeth. They followed every part of God's law, and Scripture says God judges them as upright. Now, obviously, they were not sinless, but that description of their life shows us that they desired to live in a way that pleased God. Highly regarding their community, again, impeccable spiritual credentials. And here's a man with that set of him, upright, faithful, that questioned the answer. A man in a moment when God said, I'm going to give you what you prayed for, was marked by unbelief. And not only can it happen to anyone, but it can happen to anyone in any place. Did you catch where Zechariah's at? He's in the temple. <laughs> More than that, he's in the Holy of Holies. He is in the presence, the place where God was present with his people. Only reserved for the priest. At that particular, one priest at that particular time on a rotation basis. And there he is in the very presence of God, this impeccable spiritual man who is marked by unbelief. And it's easy for us to point fingers. He knew he was in the presence of God. He knew he'd been charged with this responsibility. It's easy to point fingers until I think about myself and I think about us. To know that as believers, the Holy Spirit resides within us. He goes before us. There is no place that we don't go without the Lord. Peter tells us we are a royal priesthood. We have constant access to God. We would say that we strive to live in a way that honors God. Yet, Zechariah demonstrates to us that we are highly susceptible to unbelief. It can happen to anyone. And thousands of churches in America are proof that it can happen to anyone in any place. Do you know that this year and next year is estimated each year that anywhere, depending on who you listen to, between six and 10,000 churches will close in the United States. Put in perspective, that's 100 minimum a week. One to 200 churches a week, 2018 through 2019, will close their doors on average. Now I begin to think about that as I was preparing this week. Seeing those numbers, wondering how it could happen, and I begin to think how often... I have to believe that God challenged those churches and gave them opportunities for growth, opportunities for life, opportunities to expand ministry, opportunities to make kingdom and community impact, but they did not believe it would happen through them. How many times did God place a pastor in that church who challenged the people through the Word of God? And most of the time they ran him off and would try to find somebody else, and they would do the same thing, and they would run him off, because they did not believe it could happen through them. And like I said, but by the grace of God, so would be, we be. Because if we're honest, through the years, as a church, you've been marked by unbelief. Unbelief that this community could be changed through the power of the gospel proclaimed by you, individually, and this church as a whole. We had an unbelief that certain individuals could even be changed by the gospel. We had an unbelief that God could even use you personally. An unbelief that things could be different than they currently are. And so we become marked as a, as a people of God by this unbelief, noticing that it can happen to anyone at any place as we gather for what we would say is worship, that God would look and go, it's unbelief. You are questioning the answer. 
And so here we are at the brink of a new year. 175 years we will begin to celebrate in the next few weeks. 175 years of ministry to this church. You know that soon we'll enter to a capital campaign to begin to address some things that should have been addressed a long time ago. And we will have to make the choice. Will we believe that God will provide and that God will use us to continue to make an impact in the world in which we live and in the community in which he's placed us? Now, it's easy to say that. But we will be forced to go, do I put my actions behind that? Do I put my resources behind that? Or do I continue to be marked by unbelief? It can happen to anyone at any place. And we need to understand that from Zechariah today. And ask ourselves, where are we like him? Where would we look at our life and go, yeah, you know what, God, I prayed for this. And you answered it, and I didn't believe. I prayed for an opportunity, and you gave it, and I didn't take advantage of the opportunity. I prayed for an open door, and God, you flew the door wide open, but it was going to make me so uncomfortable that I didn't walk through the door. Instead, I closed it myself. And that those instances and similar things would be said of our life. It can happen to anyone at any place. second observation I want us to make is that this is created by a lack of expectancy. We get here in this place of unbelief because we don't expect things to be different or for God to work. Five times a year, Zechariah would leave his house for the temple. Three of those times were in the major three, uh, three major Jewish festivals where every priest served at the temple. Then each division had two other weeks a year when they carried out the daily sacrifices and rituals. So the three festivals and two weeks out of the year. You say, well, how did they do that? Well, there were over 18,000 priests in Judea. So they had plenty. They could just spread the work around. These guys were not overworked. But then when it became your week, who had the opportunity to go into the Holy of Holies was selected by lot. We see a lot almost as a drawing out of a hat we would say, but where the, the Spirit of God uh, oversees that, and God's will is known through this selection process. And once in a lifetime, a priest had the opportunity to enter the temple and offer up the incense offering. Once you were selected, your name was never put back in the hat again. So Zechariah, as we see, is old in years. He calls himself old. The text says that he and Elizabeth were both very old in verse 7. And his name is drawn from the hat. After all these years, he has the opportunity to offer up the sacrifice. It's presumed then that he would follow the command that God had given to Moses of preparing himself before he entered the holy place to burn the incense offering. So he would go throughout that process, and the time came when he entered the Holy of Holies. And there on the incense altar, he burned the special spices. And the, aromas, the aroma that, that came symbolized the prayer of the people ascending to God. And as the incense burned, Zechariah would fall to the floor in humble prayer, and the people outside that were gathered would pray. Verse 10 tells us that. All the assembled worshipers were, out, were praying outside. Well, why did Zechariah pray? Well, we don't know. But I think it's a pretty good idea that he probably was still praying for a child. But his responsibility was to pray for the nation and pray for the Messiah that they were waiting upon. So the incense comes up, his responsibility, he falls on the floor, he's in prayer. And he's praying for God to send the Messiah, but he really didn't expect it to happen. Because all of a sudden, an angel appears and begins to tell him, about the Messiah that's going to come and the role that his son, whom he has prayed for, is going to play in the coming of this Messiah. And Zechariah missed it all because he didn't expect it to happen. 
He's fulfilling his priestly duties, but he's just going through the motions. He's doing what he was supposed to do, falling on the ground, offering the incense. It's going up. He falls on the ground, and he's praying. The people are outside praying, but he had no expectations for God to answer his prayer. Why? Well, have you realized it's been 400 years since God has spoken? 400 years there's been no new prophecies. 400 years there has been been no visions for 400 years there's been no angelic appearances god has been silenced god has not spoken for 400 years from the end of the old testament to where we are now and when god does speak he chooses to speak to zachariah again to tell him about the coming savior the messiah and he tells him that he's going to use this son that he's prayed for but zachariah does not believe now consider, listen for just a second. These are the last words in the Old Testament, the last words that the people are hanging on to in Malachi chapter 4. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. Listen, he will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the lamb with total destruction. So that's what they've been holding on to, is that God is going to fulfill this word. Okay, he turned the hearts of the parents to their children, the hearts of the children to their parents. What does he tell Zechariah in Luke chapter 1, verse 17? And he, speaking of his son, John the Baptist, he will go on before the Lord in the power and spirit of Elijah, listen, to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient of the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. He is essentially telling Zechariah the last words that, that God spoke 400 years ago that you've been holding on to are going to come fulfilled through your son. And Zechariah says, how can this be? How can I be sure of this? There was no expectancy for God to work. I've shared with you before, I went to a high school that, that prior to my time and still now hardly wins any football games. One of the largest schools playing in the largest classification in Arkansas, but way outnumbered. And so I can remember when, when we played, we won four games one year, and that's like winning the Super Bowl, okay? And so we, we get moved up to this higher classification, and, and we are getting our, our brains beat out every game. And I can remember one day before a game, we're, we're stretching you know, out on the field doing that stuff, and one guy speaking up and saying, you know what? How are we supposed to win this game when the coaches don't even expect us to win? Man, what are you talking about? We've been practicing all week. They gave us the game plan. He said, look at them. They don't expect us to win. He began to point out some things that he was seeing in the coaches that showed there was no expectancy at all. And how often... Would someone say of us, man, you talk about God changing the world, but you don't have any expectations of him doing that. You talk about God changing lives, but you don't have any expectation that God would change the lives of people around you or that God would change your life. We have no expectancy. And so therefore, we don't believe that God could do what he says he can do. You know, we often get frustrated, we get bored, we get discouraged with our personal lives. We get those frustrated, bored, discouraged with the church because we don't expect God to work. Could it be that we don't see lives change because we don't expect it? Do we leave here the same every week, just going through the motions because we don't expect God to change us when we come into this place? Do we ever leave disappointed that somebody wasn't saved? Because we spent time that week sharing the gospel with somebody or inviting somebody to come to church where they'll encounter the transforming power of the gospel? Probably not. So we come with no expectations, and we leave disappointed that nothing happened. But we didn't expect God to do anything. But yeah, we went through the motions just like Zechariah did. We'll bow, we're supposed to bow, stand, we're supposed to stand, maybe sing, we're supposed to sing, give, we're supposed to give. But we don't expect 
our lives to be transformed. And when God comes bursting through to give the answer, we question the answer. And we would be marked by unbelief. I found this quote in a leadership magazine thing that's going to pop up. There we go. Living expectantly means more than just trusting my life to God. I love this next sentence. Living expectantly is faith on tiptoe. Living expectantly means believing with God that life is worth living. Believing that ministry will never become routine for me. Believing that in God I will never experience the dullness of the daily. I live with the expectancy that in my life God will do a new thing that will transcend the past. Could that be said of you? Believing that things will not become routine and mundane. Living faith on tiptoe. It can happen to anybody at any place where we do not expect God to work. And we have to understand thirdly that this displeases God. The unbelief displeases God. Do you see that in verse 18? Zechariah asked the question. He's overwhelmed. He couldn't take in this announcement. I mean, he's too old for this to happen. So what does he do? He needs a sign. How can this be? I want you to think about it. Mary talked about her last week. She asked the question, how will this be since I'm a virgin? Hers was a request for more information because she later would say, I'm the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. But Zechariah was questioning God. Refusing to believe that God could and would do the impossible in his life. And so we see the displeasure. The angel identifies himself as Gabriel. Zechariah would have known that Gabriel represented God to Daniel previously. So his presence should have been enough. But Zechariah seems to completely dismiss the idea that God could enable an old couple to have a baby, even though there was precedent for that in the account of Abraham and Sarah. We've seen God do the impossible in Scripture, and yet Zechariah never considered that. He couldn't believe his eyes. In such an awesome situation, in the Holy of Holies, in the presence of God, unbelief faces divine discipline. Verse 20. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words which will come true at their appointed time. We need to understand that unbelief cannot stop God's plans. But it does cause us to displease God and to face his discipline. There's irony here. That same angel would appear to Mary who was young. He announced a greater miracle to her, a virgin birth. And here's Mary, who was younger and did not have the track record of Zechariah, who believed the angel's message without doubt. And it's a warning to those who have been in the faith a while, that sometimes new believers' faith can quickly surpass those who are seasoned in life because you forget how to trust God, or you never learned how to trust God. And so oftentimes you get uncomfortable when someone who's new in the faith but yet is living with belief surpasses you and they challenge you and some of the things they say and the things that they're doing and how God is using them, it makes you uncomfortable. And it's because they've surpassed you in spiritual maturity. I don't like personal conflict. I, I, my, most of us, you know, I you want people to like you. You want relationships to be healthy. Every couple has been told not to go to bed angry. It goes right along to Scripture. We're told not to let the sun set on your anger. And that's because it eats away at us most of the time when someone is displeased with us. Someone's not happy with some actions or, or some words, whatever it is, whether that's at home or at work or wherever you may go. For the most part, we don't like it when someone's displeased with us. So eventually, you'll have the conversation. Hey, I don't know what happened, or 
Maybe you do know, you apologize, you seek restoration in that relationship. But, does it upset us when we displease God? When we, in our doubt that leads to unbelief, we sin and it displeases God, do we get that upset about it? Are we willing to come to Him in humility, admitting the wrong that's there, and acknowledging the sin that's in our life, and asking for His forgiveness? So that there's nothing that hinders our relationship. Or or are we just okay for God to be displeased with us? One thing I'm grateful for in this passage that I want you to understand is that when we fail, and we will, God keeps his promises. Zechariah had some time to search his heart. When you can't speak for a few months, it'll give you time to look inside, don't you think? And we don't know how all the details happened, but it's obvious that he inspected his heart and saw the disbelief. And he obeyed. He believed, first of all, and he obeyed God. But at the end, Elizabeth already knew that his name was to be John. And that's the objective of discipline. It's not just for punishment or for pain or to experience displeasure. But it's so that we will correct our actions and obey. And that's what Zechariah did. Searched his heart, changed his heart, and was obedient to God. And when he does speak, he breaks out in praise to God at the end of chapter 1. So the question is, where, where will we leave here? With no expectation, so we came in not expecting anything, so nothing changes. Or will we realize we've displeased God and change our heart so that God can keep his promise to us? It boils down to us and our faithfulness to not question the answer. One thing I want us to notice, though, another, one other thing regarding unbelief is that it's noticeable to others. People notice that it can happen to anyone and the lack of expectation for God to change anything. Because when Zechariah comes out of the holy place, it's evident to the people that something out of the ordinary happened to him while he was ministering there. They're wondering what took him so long, verse 21 tells us. And then he comes out, and the, the priest, the first thing he was supposed to do was stand on the steps of the temple and pray for the people. So Zechariah exits the holy place, and there was probably a collective sigh from those who knew that there were several times throughout history where the priest didn't do the job right and died inside the holy place. And so they see, oh, whew, he's alive, he came out. So they re- they're excited about that, but yet they realize he can't say anything. He can't pray for us. What happened inside of there? And they begin to wonder. He gives signs, but he can't speak, verse 22. He's trying to communicate what happened, but they can't catch up with it, can't catch on. And it was noticeable to them, his unbelief. They didn't know all the story. They knew something had happened in there. Upon returning home, it's believed that he was able to write or somehow communicate with Elizabeth. Again, she knew to call the child John. But every day in his house, when his wife looked at him and he couldn't speak back, she was reminded of his sin. She she knew. Here's one of the priests that did something that displeased God and is paying the consequences for it now. And I'm sure the story was told around town. Hey, y'all heard of John, or if uh, Zachariah started talking yet? Maybe the next time they went to the temple. I sure hope this priest does better than Zachariah. He hadn't talked since that day. The word began to spread, and it was noticeable to other people. The unbelief, the sin, is Zachariah's life. 
See, when you live in unbelief, it's noticeable to others. Most of the time, it's noticeable because you're miserable. You're unhappy. You have a sour demeanor about your life. You're the one that walks in a room and sucks the air out because you're miserable with your life. You're not a joy to be around. And others notice that. And we oftentimes excuse it. Well, that's just who they are. That's their personality. Or if you'd been through what they'd been through in life, you'd be sour too. Or they just had a rough spot in life. We begin to excuse this behavior. And those things may be true. But if we'll begin to remove the layers in life and get past the excuses, get past the surface, more times than not, we find that there's an area of unbelief. Oftentimes that has been there for years. And maybe even the people who are miserable have forgotten why they're the way they are. And others notice your unbelief. They may not know exactly what happened, but they notice the way you live your life. Through the years, obviously, I've encountered a lot of angry church members, frustrated church members, nitpicking church members that are upset about something, something that's real pity most of the time that they want to be all up in arms about. And some of you experience, I don't listen to it very long. And I begin to ask questions. And most of the time, the reason that they're angry or they're nitpicking or they're frustrated is because they're really miserable in unbelief. That something small set them off because on the, underneath all of that, there's an area of unbelief where God gave an open door and they weren't obedient. God gave an answer to a prayer and they questioned the answer. That there was something where they were Zachariah. And they never thought it would happen to them. But they didn't expect God to really do what he did. And they lived in disbelief, and they live a life that displeases God. And it's noticeable to others. My question is, could this be you today? Could it be that you would say, man, I never thought it would happen? To me, and in this place. But you're right, Clint. I'm miserable because I'm marked by unbelief. Nothing to do with your salvation. You believe in Jesus Christ and you're saved. But there's no expectations for God to do a work in and through your life and in and through this church. There's no expectation. For God to speak to you here today, you were just going to go through the motions. But now you're in the place of Zechariah. God, by His Spirit and through His Word, speaks. And while an angel doesn't stand before you, the Word of God is powerful, and it's cut. And God has put His finger on that area of unbelief in your life. It may have been there a few days, or it may have been there a few decades. And He's now is waiting to see if you're ready to come out of the time of silence. If you're ready to come out of the time of being miserable and experience the joy that he gives. And the joy that Zachariah was able to express when he could speak and share with others about his son who was going to prepare the way for the Lord. Could it be today that you're the way you are? You're angry, you're frustrated, you're discouraged, whatever other adjective you want to put in there because you're marked by unbelief. Let's pray together. Holy God, it's hard for me to fathom that you use people like those of us gathered in this place. But I know that you can. 
I believe that you can. I pray, Lord, as we come to this time of response, that we would respond as you would have for us too. Lord, this place, in some ways, could be defined by unbelief. Individual lives could be characterized by unbelief. And we have displeased you. So let us come in humility, acknowledging that and repenting of that so that we can experience the promise in which you've made to us. Lord, I pray that you would break down walls, that you would shatter hard hearts. Let us be obedient as you led. There's some who need to make public decisions, some who need to become a part of this church. And maybe there's some, Lord, that are so characterized by unbelief that they never have placed their faith in Jesus. Whatever the case is for people today, let us all be faithful and obedient to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As God has spoken to you today, it's your chance. Will you leave in belief or unbelief? Let's stand together. Let us leave in belief through our response to God's leading as we sing. you speak to our heart help us to be better servants of yours to be more obedient Lord I just thank you for the honor and privilege of being in your house today we give you all the honor and glory because only you are worthy Lord I pray now that we will be obedient in the giving of our tithes and offerings and that you will use them to further your kingdom for it's in your son's name Jesus we pray Amen. Amen. <clears throat>
I pray that will be our prayer as we enter into the new year. And uh, this will wraps up our services for the year. Uh, we will uh, not have services Wednesday. We'll be back on that schedule next Wednesday. So after next Sunday, we'll be full steam ahead. I uh, so hope you have a great week and look forward to being back here starting off the new year uh, next week as we look at some reasons, just reminders of why we're here. Uh, so look forward to that time together. <coughs> Uh, note the things in your bulletin. Uh, there's an insert in there. You've had one the last few weeks, and that's for it, those are in there because of you who haven't signed up yet to get your picture made. Uh, those are not for you just to have something else to stick in the back of the, the pew rack there. Um, and so I want to encourage you, if you haven't done that, if you would call the office, let us help you, or go sign up online yourself. Go to the church website, and you'll see the spot to hit. Uh, that will take you. You can select the time that works best for you. Uh, but just going to give you a heads up. If you don't do it, you're going to get called about it. And you're going to get asked about it. And so you'll save everybody a headache if you'll just go ahead and do it, okay? Uh, just a reminder, you get the free 8 by 10 You are not required to order any pictures. Uh, you don't even have to look at them. You can tell them. You'll look at them at home and make a decision if that's what you want to do. Uh, they've told me if you say no three times, they're done. So just look at them, say no, no, and no, okay? And uh, pick out the picture that you want, that you want in the directory, uh, but encourage you to, to get signed up for those and uh, the dates and everything are there on the website and in your bulletin as well. Lastly, as we leave today, it's the fifth Sunday, so it's the time when we take up our benevolence offering. So guys will be at the door, and hopefully you are, were aware of that and prepared for that. Just opportunity for us to bless people within our church and our community. I wish I could share the stories uh, of how you have done that over the last few weeks, but know that you have kept families uh, in their homes, and you have kept families warm uh, when it was cold. Uh, but, but, you know, when they found themselves just in a tight spot, working families uh, that came, uh, some with a relationship we already had, others that we didn't, but gave us opportunity to demonstrate the love of Christ because of your faithful uh, giving of this offering in the past. So, uh, thank you for that, and know that you'll continue to be faithful today. Let's stand together, and we're going to sing I've Seen the Light as we are dismissed. <laughs>